When the armistice was signed to end the First World War, Hitler was lying in a hospital bed. He had been blinded by a gas attack. Like many soldiers, he was horrified to hear that the war was over. He felt stabbed in the back by the government back home in Germany. He was then sent on a special assignment by the army to spy on extreme fringe political groups. One of these groups, Hitler, ended up joining, the Nazi party. He was instrumental in helping to draft their manifesto in 1920. The party was extremely right-wing, nationalistic, wanted to deny citizenship to Jews, wanted to destroy the Treaty of Versailles and return Germany to its former greatness. Hitler was joined in the party by many other disaffected, disillusioned young army men who wanted to tear down democracy and bring authoritarian government back to Germany. Many of these young men joined what Hitler created, which was the Storm Troopers, or SA, Storm Abteilung. These brown-shirted political thugs were used to protect Nazi party meetings, to beat up the Nazi's opponents, and to project a sense of military strength from the Nazi party. The Nazi party in this period really was a home for disillusioned young men. They appealed to this nationalistic sense that many German soldiers had, that somehow their country had been betrayed, that politicians had ended the war too early. It was amongst these people that the Nazis got support, but it was also amongst these people that many ultra-right-wing parties gained traction in this period. From 1920 to 1923, the Nazis remained one of what were many ultra-right-wing, fringe, extremist parties. This all changed in 1923. Furious at the Weimar government's decision to call off passive resistance and to give in to what he saw as the French illegal invasion of the Ruhr, Hitler and the Nazis decided to act. They hatched a plan to overthrow the government of Munich and then the Weimar Republic as a whole. Bursting into a beer hall, they held the Bavarian Prime Minister Gustav Kahr at gunpoint until he agreed to join their putsch. However, the Nazis made a fatal error. When Kahr left the beer hall, having never been fully committed to the putsch, he communicated with the Weimar government exactly what Hitler was planning. A deal was cut whereby left-wing governments in other parts of the Weimar Republic would be replaced and removed, and in return, Carr and the army would help to face down Hitler's right-wing challenge. The next day, the Nazis and Hitler marched across Munich, but the police were waiting. Shots were fired, Hitler was pushed to the ground, injured his shoulder, escaped, but was later arrested. The putsch had failed completely. From the very beginning, this putsch was doomed to failure. It was poorly planned, and Hitler had seriously misjudged the mood of the Bavarian government. Not only that, he had misjudged the mood of many Germans at this time. The hyperinflation crisis was being solved. The German people were looking forward to a calmer political and economic situation. When you're revising this early period of the Nazi party, Think carefully about how central Hitler was to the party. Think carefully about exactly what they stood for and how that appealed to a certain group of Germans at this time. However, you also need to consider the reasons why the Munich Putsch failed. As we'll see later, maybe in the long term the Munich Putsch wasn't a failure, but in the short term it was, and it's important that you understand the reasons why it could not succeed. After the disastrous failure of the Munich Putsch, Hitler was arrested and put on trial. He and his co-conspirators were charged with an attempt to overthrow the government. However, he used this trial as a platform from which to express his political ideas. And as the media became more and more interested in his words, he became something of a national celebrity.
During the trial, Hitler argued that his act was not treasonous at all. In fact, his attempt to overthrow the government was an act of German heroism, an act of nationalism. It was the Weimar Republic and their government that were really treasonous. During the trial, Hitler wowed the watching galleries and media with his fiery oratory. This, coupled with a very sympathetic judge and jury, meant he only got nine months in Landsberg prison. A remarkably short period of time for a man who had tried to overthrow a democratically elected government. This prison was more of a right-wing holiday camp. Hitler was allowed to receive visitors, wander around the grounds, and he spent much of his time writing Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, his political testament in which he laid out his ideology and his hopes for the future of Germany. It was in Mein Kampf that Hitler really spelled out his vision for Germany. A very, very dark vision indeed for many people who were not included in Hitler's idea of what Germany should be. In this book, he railed against communism and he railed against the Jews. He blamed all of the problems of the Weimar Republic on politicians and the Treaty of Versailles, which he said had to be destroyed if Germany was to be great again. During Hitler's time in prison, the Nazi party almost collapsed without his leadership. When he came out, he decided on a new strategy for the party of votes, to not violence. Even though he detested Weimar democracy, he thought the Nazis needed to hold their noses, as he said, and try and campaign for votes alongside other political parties. These years in the mid-1920s were characterised by the Nazis developing something of a political machine, trying to set up headquarters and party establishment in different parts of Germany. In 1926, Hitler faced a challenge to his leadership at the Bamberg Conference. But, having achieved the support of the majority of its members, Hitler emerged from that conference as the undisputed leader of the Nazi party. In this period of the mid-1920s, the Nazis attempted to set up a political organisation, a political machine, with different party organisations in different parts of the country. They also changed their political message in order to appeal to different constituencies within the German electorate. The membership of the party grew steadily. However, by 1928, they were polling at 2.6%. The vast majority of the German electorate completely rejected their policies and ideals. They were, to all intents and purposes, despite Hitler being a national political figure, something of an irrelevance. The party was a fringe extremist group of individuals, something of a joke. When you're revising this period, what you need to think carefully about is the longer term impact of the Munich Putsch. Okay, it was a failure in the short term, but in the longer term, it allowed Hitler to get some national fame, and then through writing Mein Kampf, it enabled him to reach a wider political audience. You also need to consider in this period how Hitler built up the Nazi political organization, how he actually created a political party that would then be able to stand for government to actually get some votes in elections. But you must realise that by 1928, the Nazis were only polling 2.6% of the vote. And you must be aware of what was going on in the Weimar Republic in relation to the golden years and link this to why the Nazis themselves were not very popular in elections during this period. Then, as our party gerade sieben Mann hoch war, brach sie schon zwei Grundsätze aus. Erstens, sie wollte eine wahrhaftige Weltanschauungspartei sein. Und zweitens, sie wollte daher kompromisslos die einzige Macht 
und alleine gemacht in Deutschland. In 1928, with the Nazis polling only 2.6% of the vote, there seemed something of a political irrelevance in Germany. But by 1932, the Nazis were polling over 30%. So clearly, the economic depression had a massive impact on the Nazis' political fortunes. Just as they picked up votes, so did the communists, as people rushed to the political extreme to try and solve the problems that the Weimar Republic was facing. So it's easy to suggest that without the economic depression there would have been no rise to power for the Nazis, and to a certain extent this is true. However, it's important that we also realise the Nazis' skillful use of propaganda. Goebbels was a genius at packaging Hitler as a superman for Germany, as the only individual who could solve the crisis, a strong man who could bring order through the chaos of this democratic experiment. So by August of 1932, the Nazis were polling 37% of the vote. They very, very skillfully exploited the economic depression, suggesting that they were the party that would solve unemployment. Hitler was the man who would bring prosperity back to Germany. In August of 1932, Hitler went to Hindenburg and demanded that he be made Chancellor. Hindenburg refused. The Nazis still did not have a majority of the German electorate voting for them. So the final reason why Hitler was able to rise to power lies in the political miscalculations of others. It was Hindenburg and the elite around him who had the final decision about who would become Chancellor. And as 1932 ended and 1933 began, it became clear that those industrialists, those landed gentry, those powerful elite at the head of the German political structure, thought that they could use Hitler as a man who could solve the problems that Germany faced. So in January of 1933, Hitler was finally appointed Chancellor by Hindenburg. He did not win electoral victory, he was appointed by Hindenburg, which means that the political miscalculations of others is the final reason why Hitler was able to become Chancellor in 1933. It's really, really important when you're revising this particular aspect of Hitler's rise to power that you understand the different factors that contributed to him eventually being appointed Chancellor. So you need to consider the role of the economic depression and the situation that caused in Germany, but you also need to understand how the Nazis exploited that. But finally, you also need to understand that despite these two events, the, the wider context of the economic depression and Hitler's ability to exploit that, he still needed other politicians to make mistakes to decide that he should become Chancellor in order for him to actually gain power. In many ways, this could be seen as a perfect storm. With the wider economic context combining with the political realities of the day to enable Hitler to become Chancellor. 